A very warm welcome from a sunny Cape Town to you all. We are delighted to host another edition of our Index Mall series, where we at Satrix, in collaboration with BlackRock, look to bring you insights from the investment trends that shape our world today. So my name is Niku Katska. I am the Head of Portfolio Solutions at Satrix, and I will be moderating this very interesting session where we explore whether tech companies and AI in general remains an investable theme looking forward. This is certainly a question I think all of us are grappling with. Now, in fact, a few, only a few topics in recent years have stirred as much emotion, uh, both positive and negative, as the rapid rise of AI we are witnessing today. People are naturally averse to significant disruption in their daily lives. And when a technology is introduce, introduced that promises to disrupt literally every aspect of our daily lives, we are left with a sense of awe and wonder, mixed with a deep-rooted sense of fear as to what a mature version of this technology in fact might entail. Now, some have suggested we are deep into an overhyped cycle and that peak AI verve has been reached, or at least soon will be, and that the actual use case of lang large language models at the heart of uh, this, uh, these, these algorithms, uh, capable of literary and visual content creation, is in fact far more limited than initially put forward by its vocal proponents. These models are, after all, not sentient and require human output scraped from the internet to use as inputs to fit their parameters. Others claim with varying degrees of enthusiasm that the algorithms have already reached the point of being indistinguishable from human intelligence and creativity. But this premise ignores the mere simple fact that despite all the efforts to anthropomorphize these al algorithms with common terms like intelligence, reasoning, and learning, that they are at their core language pattern recognition tools that are scaled through advances in computing power. They therefore by design lack understanding and true context, which is at the core of intelligence and true creativity. In its current form, AI is a masterclass in mimicry, a phenomenal paradigm capable of efficiently summarizing content from the internet, but not a tool that can apply its mind despite the proponents' best efforts to convince us otherwise, at least with the current technology we have at our disposal. Now, irrespective of our views on whether and to what extent the technology is in fact destined to disrupt our lives, the toothpaste has been squeezed from the tube. We have been irreversibly thrust on a path to discover how far this artificial te generative technology will mature and how it will ultimately impact society in the future, be it as a net positive or a net negative force. Now, at this point, we can at best only speculate. The speed, however, of getting to a world of broad-based generative AI integration will depend on various factors. First, first, physical constraints in terms of hardware requirements mean that access to expensive computing equipment, silicon chips, and data warehouses, coupled with their vast power needs, are not immaterial constraints. There's no hiding from the fact that improving these algorithms happen with an exponential cost curve. Second, as with the emergence of any new productivity boosting technology, the question of, of adoption speed also depends on how all facets of society will embrace it. Some have argued that government institutions should, should limit its unbridled development for fear of mass worker dis displacement and the possibility of nation states deploying it for nefarious reasons. Others argue that markets are best placed to adopt and absorb new technologies and that it should be ultimately be a societal good through improving productivity, access to information, and redefining our notions of creativity and ingenuity. Irrespective of where you stand on this debate of whether it will have a positive or negative impact on society, it is worth remembering that one of the greatest impediments to the fear displacement of labor might be the companies set to benefit from these technologies themselves. There is an inherent tension for companies to appease both Wall Street and Main Street or in the South African case, I suppose, Maud Street and Church Street. While companies no doubt will start to feel the investor pressure to use the technology to improve efficiencies and reduce costs, most also care about not being seen as cold-hearted capitalists, only in the interest of the bottom line. Outside the notoriously cutthroat world of Silicon Valley, few large employers have intimated a desire for a mass replacement of human workers in favor of machines and end users would arguably be slow to warm to the idea in favor of automated production of creative, uh, creative output as well. Now, the likely effect 
could thus rather be a slower and more gradual adoption of this new technology, given workers, giving workers then a chance to adapt and to learn to work alongside ge powerful generative AI capabilities in a way that might not be fully clear now. This is similar to how we adapted in, in hindsight effortlessly to life with the internet in a way that might have been unthinkable a mere generation before. Now to debate these weighty matters further with us today, I've, uh, we, we've uh, uh, collated a diverse collection of experts that will give us their current perspectives on how this fast changing technology might evolve in coming quarters and years. Specifically, we are unpacking today whether there remains an investment case for the companies and sectors at the forefront of AI development in light of very strong performance in recent, recent years. We also delve into whether fears of an AI bubble reminiscent of the dot-com crash is misplaced or not, and also whether geopolitical fragmentation could serve to strongly curtail access to key components required in the production of computing infrastructure that is required to achieve the promised broad-based adoption of AI. Before we invite our panelists, however, uh, to, show their, to share their thoughts, let's take a quick poll to assess whether you, the audience, believe that AI will mature and disrupt your personal line of work in the next three years. So I'm go going to uh, push this poll. It should appear on your screen in a second. And so the question is very simply, do you believe AI will mature and disrupt your personal line of work in the next three years? So while we are waiting for everyone to select their choice, just a reminder that you can pose your questions uh, using the ask your question box at the bottom, and we will try to leave time at the end for Q&A. See the questions are, the answers are coming through. I'll give it 10 more seconds. And this is specifically to you individually, whether you believe um, this will impact your, uh, yourself. So I see the answers are rushing in. So I'll give it 10 more seconds. Okay, let's stop it there. Okay, so only 27% of you strongly agree um, that AI will, in fact, mature and disrupt your personal line of work. More than half of you say, I agree, although it will mostly serve to make me more productive, so the glass half full. And then a not insignificant 16% of you, um, well, 15% disagree that it will be less disruptive, um, and then a few of you have to still ask ChatGPT. You can send us your answers after you got the insights. Okay, um, so the first panelist that I want to welcome uh, here today is Michael Normile, Director of Economic and Statistical Research at the NASDAQ. Welcome, Michael. You're making your debut on Index More. It's great to have you. Thanks. Happy to be here. Appreciate you uh, having me. Yeah, so Michael, as the economist on our panel, I want to reserve the really tough philosophical questions to you. Um, that might not have a clear answer, but requires a more nuanced debate. So I do apologize in advance, but we're going we're gonna to get really philosophical now, and then later on we'll get to more uh, sort of the investment type questions. So first off, Michael, um, some have suggested that AI hype has run its course, and we should pay back our expectations of how these large language models could in fact disrupt industries in the future. Others have argued that there is more substance to this broad-based application than, say, the Web3 that we saw recently, cryptocurrencies or the metaverse, that there's actually more to this AI um, uh, uh, technology that's emerging. Um, as those at the forefront of AI development are, in fact, real companies with real cash backing their investments, and they're not merely ideas or fantasies of a fully decentralized world. Where do you think reality ends and hype begins when it comes to AI? Well, I guess uh, I'll start with saying my answer to the poll question was that I agree it's going to be disruptive, but is going to help me be more productive in my role. So I think looking at where we are right now, I think AI, it's not a fad, um, but I think the hype has gone beyond the usefulness currently. Uh, so the potential outcomes that we see looking at you know, the long-term run 
range from you know creating a new human utopia to human extinction so it's you see all it's basically the range of outcomes that people predict are as wide as it gets and in reality right now we're a year and a half into a multi-year multi-decade cycle of figuring out how to incorporate ai in productive ways and you know, of course, jobs will be lost, but other jobs will also be created. And that's just what happens historically with disruptive technologies like you know, improvements in manufacturing, the Internet, all those types of things. And hopefully we'll also see productivity increase along with it, which has a lot of benefits for the economy as well. But so to put some numbers on it right now, only 5% of companies have adopted AI. Another 6% are planning to use it but a full 25% have banned it currently. And that's just because of the risks associated with it. You know, there's concerns about uh, hallucinations where it gives uh, an answer that essentially is made up. Um, and people also perhaps the learning curve involved where you've seen stories about people uploading sensitive data to public AIs like ChatGPT and things like that. Um, but we are starting to see clear use cases and uh, examples of disruption have started. So you've got one that's been quite popular is content generation where uh, kind of more rote articles can just be easily spun out by by AI, saving a lot of time for uh, you know some news sites. Uh, then also biotech for drug design, because with these large language models, you can also think of things like molecular structure almost being like a language. And so the AI can learn that language too and come up with different protein structures and things like that that might take human scientists a long time to develop, whereas the AI can do it much more quickly and that can save a lot of time in, in drug uh, production. And then you've got also you know, co-pilots for software engineers. And then there's all the video and, and graphics that are useful for art and filmmaking. I think we have to see over time in cases of especially things like art where people may kind of reject art created by AI compared to human art uh, in, in a sense. Uh, and, and also, you know, there was an article yesterday that uh, entry level investment banking roles may be impacted in the near term by AI. But research shows that AI really helps enhance productivity. There was a study about uh, call centers where it helped essentially improve the performance performance of lower performing workers closer to that of the best performing workers. So you can kind of train the AI based on the best performing workers and help kind of lift everyone up. So creating that kind of productivity boost there. But as it stands right now, AI, it's definitely a supplemental tool for workers rather than a replacement for workers. Um, and then, you know, you mentioned this in your uh, introduction, but you know, one of the concerns is uh, energy consumption from AI. So data centers right now, they use about 4% uh, of US uh, power requirements. I'm in New York, so that's you know looking at uh, US data here, but it's projected that it could be 20 to 25% of US power consumption by the end of this decade. So, you know, the infra infrastructure is not there right now. And so a chat GPT query uses 10 times the energy of a Google search. So it's just not quite scalable so that's where you get to the point where it's a lot of hype moving beyond what is actually capable with it right now it's a fascinating time to be alive i mean uh, and so the the one question that i also have is, is proponents have debated that the end goal uh to this development the sort of where, where we where we're heading to in the future is something called artificial general intelligence or agi which is essentially a sci-fi dream where machines become equal or even exceed the cognitive processing power of humans. Now, could you share perhaps your views on whether this is achievable with our current technologies? Um, or do you think it will remain a theoretic dream for decades to come, much like nuclear fusion, which we know in theory how to develop. It's just, you know, the practicalities behind it is so vast that we might never achieve it. Yeah, so I think the, the obvious answer is we're clearly not there right now, even though, you know, even the most advanced AIs currently are nowhere near that threshold. So current LLMs, they're just predicting the next word in a string, essentially, based on their trading, training data. But we recently, we recently had OpenAI and Meta say that they're rolling out models near term that can reason, plan, and have memory. Uh, and so 
adding reason, adding reasoning would allow an AI model to search over possible answers, plan the sequence of actions, and then build its own mental model of what the effects of its actions are going to be. So, you know, I'm hesitant to say that we can't have AGI because the, you know, quote unquote hope is that AI will see exponential improvements and, you know, humans are much better thinking in linear, in linear terms than exponential terms. Uh, but the idea is that we get to the point where AI, they can create synthetic training data and keep improving. So they're no longer reliant on training data that is on the internet that they can scrape. They can create their own kind of data sets to improve upon. Uh, and at that point you might start seeing, you know, that kind of shift to that exponential improvement. But if it is possible, it definitely does not seem near term with current technologies, the high cost of building and running AI models and the infrastructure hurdles that I was, I was talking about previously. And then of course you get to the challenges from a regulatory perspective where the you know, risks of AI as we get to that even sub AGI level um, creates risks of misuse. And then the fact that there are open source AI models will make that an even bigger challenge. And I, th I think I think the genie's out of the bottle, right? In, in some extent, I mean, we, we're not we're not pulling it back. We're not pulling back our development of this technology further. So, the sky is is to some extent the limit when it comes to our imagination for how this might might proceed. So, I take your point there. Um, now, considering your views so far, is there an investment case remaining for uh, the developed market tech sector, uh, considering how hard it has run the last few years? I mean, is is there any merit to say this this remains an investable sector? Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people are bringing up the kind of dot, dot com bubble as a comparison point. You mentioned it earlier on. And, you know, right now, I think it's not a, a fair comparison to what we've seen with the, the run up in AI stocks specifically. Uh, right now, in terms of scale, the NASDAQ 100, it's up, I think, 70% from the end of 2022 versus in the, the dot com bubble, it got up to 300%. Uh, and you're also not seeing the case where non-profitable tech companies are participating. So these are companies with you know real earnings that are driving these uh, these increases in their in their stock prices. Uh, and the recent, although it is true that the recent run in developed market tech, they've seen partly multiple expansion driving it. But like I said, it's also earnings. So there is a, a fundamental aspect underpinning it. I think the thing to remember is right now though, those earnings aren't being driven by AI. Um, so valuations show that these stocks are expensive, especially those kinds of like core AI companies that you might think of. But if you're looking at valuations based on the next 12 months, that's not going to capture earnings from AI because those are going to be much farther off. So, you know, if you think how as an individual you use chat GPT, there's no ads, you're not getting so there's no ad revenue coming from ChatGPT, for example. I, you know, I'm sure they make money licensing it to Microsoft for their uh, Microsoft Edge browser, uh, using it in Copilot and things like that. But kind of the classic Google Google search model, where you type something in and an ad is, you know, the top result. Um, you know, you're not seeing that currently with ChatGPT. And so, those valuations right now they look really high because they're taking into account those far in the future earnings that people have kind of started to price in, but the actual earnings component of, of PE isn't capturing that. So you also see a lot of those AI related valuations that's mostly in hardware and software providers. But if AI is as disruptive as many people think, you know, I think we could see that there's gonna be a lot more uh, broader benefits. And it's quite likely that we see new companies and even subsectors emerge that don't currently exist. Absolutely, and if any, you know, if anything we learned this last decade, it is that, you know, our counting standards um, are not great at uh, capturing the potential for technologies to emerge and to to change our earnings outlook fundamentally. Uh, and if, if AI allows that to rebase completely, or well, these companies that are at the forefront of its development might actually be extremely cheap at the moment. So it's a, it's an interesting time. It's an interesting thing to consider. Thank you, thank you for your time, Michael. Really appreciate that. Um, next, I want to welcome Laura Cooper. Uh, she's the Senior Investment Strategist at BlackRock, and she is no stranger to this webinar. Welcome back, Laura. Thanks again for having me. So, Laura, how do you see geopolitical fragmentation um, broadly 
impacting chip manufacturing and supply in coming years? And what will be the potential impact on the ability of tech companies to deliver on their hopes of a more broad-based application of recent uh, advances in AI algorithms? Should there be some disruption in the future? Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, certainly geopolitical fragmentation is something that we've discussed quite in depth here at BlackRock because we do see it as one of our key mega forces that is actually already playing out now. And that's largely reflective of this hardening, competing geopolitical and economic blocks. So geopolitical fragmentation is already driving a surge in strategic sectors like tech, but we are already seeing signs of supply chain challenges. And I think this reflects a tension shifting towards reshoring and greater strategic competition. So for example, you know, when we think about how are companies securing semiconductor supplies, well, this is actually coming through in recent policy. So if we think back to Q4 of last year, the US placed additional restrictions on foreign access to domestic semiconductor technology. And this was largely an action to maintain a competitive advantage over AI tech and innovation. And this is likely going to be an example of what we expect to see in the future come through, where trade policy could become mutually exclusive. And there could actually come a time where companies have to align with, with regions, which in theory could impact the ability to deliver on these hopes of broad-based applications of AI algorithms. But I think that said, you know, we're starting to see signs that companies are very aware of these risks and they're already taking action. So interestingly enough, firms are increasingly diversifying their supply chains, but we do expect this to be quite a slow process. If we think U.S. Uh, semiconductor firms generate still around 30 percent of their sales from one foreign region in particular, they're not going to want to diversify away from that stream too quickly. And why is that? Well, because semi-supply will continue to be a key concern for tech firms. I mean, we're hearing continually from companies that demand is not necessarily the challenge right now, but it is really supply. So as we continue to see advancements in AI and wider applications, securing supply to the best chips will be critical. So in a supply constrained environment, it may actually be easier for the largest and most profitable companies to operate. Now we can think this is largely due to higher profits, could mean a greater ability to pay higher prices for critical supplies, or it could be supplier relationships are stronger in securing these key components ahead of rivals or the ability to stockpile ahead of potential supply constraints. So the geopolitical tensions or fragmentation could actually create this dispersion within, within the sector. But ultimately, we think it's going to be a key mega force that, yes, will impact chip manufacturing and supply in coming years. But we continue to see the most compelling opportunities at the foundation of the tech stack when we think about AI. And this is namely in processing chips and global semiconductors, where global sales totaled close to $48 billion in January, which was an increase of 15% year on year. And big tech is really well positioned, we think, to be kind of a driver of this, a strong tailwind, as we've already seen quite robust forward guidance on investment plans if we think back to the Q4 earnings season. So I think geopolitical fragmentation will create kind of rumbles ahead, but it's certainly not going to disrupt meaningfully that this AI trend going forward. So considering what you said, do you think the, the U.S., and in particular the Magnificent Seven companies, can remain the leaders in AI development going forward? Um, and yeah. if, if so, where do you think likely challenges will emerge from? Yeah, it's a really great question. I mean, certainly we see the performance of, of these tech companies year, year to date and even over the past year. And, you know, it raises questions about the sustainability of that. But we've already explored some of the policy support that is, the U.S. is putting in place to further secure semi-supply. But I think there are other important considerations that could actually continue to give the U.S. advantages in this artificial intelligence sp space. So first, we can Think about the success, that's been a big advantage for the U.S. 
We do see vast amounts of venture capital, human capital, educational facilities concentrated in the region. And so this is continuing to help U.S. firms attract the top talent. And of course, there's the network effects this creates in boosting innovation, and that's not easily replicated. And of course, we have to keep in mind direct and indirect government support for firms within this system that does add another significant advantage for these U.S. companies. And then second thing that comes to mind is just the incredible amounts that these U.S. firms are devoting to research and development. So on a macro level, the U.S. devotes around 3.5% of GDP to R&D, and it is ranked third in the Global Innovation Index. So in 2023, it came in just behind Sweden and Switzerland. Now, at the micro level, some of these magnificent seven companies have spent actually hundreds of billions of dollars on R&D over the past couple of decades. And on average, some are now spending more than 10 billion a year. So we do think this is a significant barrier for entry for new en entrants because the first mover advantage here is also important. So U.S. firms have been able to launch generative AI products to millions of users, and that could provide a significant moat around U.S. dominance in artificial intelligence through getting users familiar with their product, developing these further through real life feedback. So I think taken together, it's really difficult to see how other countries can meaningfully break this dominance, at least in the in the near term. And um, we think this is you know, going to have a significant step up from government support, trade policy, immigration policies. These are really needed for countries to compete with the existing innovative infrastructure in the US. Now, the EU could potentially be a candidate. We're seeing countries such as Sweden, Switzerland, and the UK rank very high in innovation, but we will need to see significantly more action in attracting talent and supporting industries for the region to really, I think, be seen as a, a clear competitor to the U.S. over the coming years. It's fascinating that the development of this technology is so closely intertwined with geopolitical tensions, and, uh, ge geographies, etc. So definitely something to keep in mind. Thanks, Laura, for your perspectives there. Re really appreciate that. Next, I want to welcome AJ Sigler. He's the product strategist for sector and thematic equity research at BlackRock. That's quite a mouthful. AJ, welcome. Glad to have you on. AJ, I want to remain on the uh, AI investment opportunities theme and get your perspective on industry trends. So first, yeah. where do you see the next level of beneficiaries of the AI theme beyond the you know, semiconductor producers and mega caps that's been benefiting uh, mostly up to now? Yeah, first off, thanks for having me on. Really excited to be here and to be talking about such an exciting topic. And, and that's a big question, you know, where are we going to find that next level of beneficiaries? If you think back last year, of course, hindsight is 2020, but it almost seemed too easy. You know, a, a handful of semiconductors invest in the mega caps and you would have had a great year. But I think it's important to, you know, remember we are in stage one of a multi-year disruptive theme. And the beneficiaries are gonna spread beyond, you know, the MAG7 and the semiconductor. So, you know, where do you go to, to answer your question? Well, the way we think about it is we think about AI in terms of a stack, or if you prefer a more colorful analogy, think of it like a, a layer cake. At the bottom of this layer cake, you have the infrastructure names. They are absolutely necessary for the rest of the build out. These are your semiconductors. These are your, your hyperscalers, the mega caps. But as you go up this stack, or up in terms of the cake, you get other beneficiaries of this theme that are gonna come later. And that later is starting to become now. Think about the data infrastructure and software names that are gonna be required for all these enterprises to actually adopt AI. So the, the CEO of Accenture, they, they made a stat that's saying only around 5% of the world's enterprise data is in a format that's going to be ca compatible for AI adoption. Only 5%, that's nothing. <laughs> you know, compare that to all the CEOs and CTOs that are saying, we have to integrate AI, we have to do this. But there's a disconnect in what can help piece that together are these software companies that work on the infrastructure, the plumbing. 
you know, kind of the, the dirtier jobs on this AI rollout that are critical. Another area could be some of the data owners. You know, we talk about how AI can impact other industries, but right now, AI, chat GPT, it's trained on what? It's trained on the internet, you know, YouTube and TikTok and Wikipedia. If you're a lawyer in the US, you probably shouldn't be using chat GPT to prepare for your court case. It's not gonna be reliable, it has too many hallucinations, but when you think about the opportunity for data, a lot of this data used by lawyers, it's owned by a few companies that put it behind a paywall. What these companies are doing is instead of opening them up to chat GPT, all this private data, they're putting AI models on top of it and then selling this subscription with AI for a premium. Now, what a brilliant idea, right? All these lawyers that have this subscription, you wanna use AI? Use our service. They've incorporated it's protected data away from you know, Wikipedia. And then at the top of the, the stack, and again, think about the beneficiaries of this theme. You know, it's the applications. You know, think about your day to day and anyone on the audience, you know, no matter you know what, what area of uh, uh, of work you're in, you know, your day to day, how much AI are you using? You know, probably not too much. You know, maybe you have Copilot, maybe you have, you know, a couple things, but there's going to be more applications for specific services, and that is all coming on the horizon. And as you move up this stack or layer cake or whatever, you know, analogy you prefer, the separation between winners and losers are going to be huge. You know, think about an example, you know, think in, you know, graphic design. Is AI good or bad? for a graphic design company. And I don't know, it's gonna be a best in class application that's gonna be winner take all. And if you're not best in class, you're probably really gonna suffer. So in short, you know, we see it evolving across this stack beyond the mag seven, beyond the mega caps and semiconductors. But take a look at, you know, some of these more unique names down the market cap spectrum. I think there's plentiful opportunities for this long-term theme. So yeah, that, that's always an interesting question. You know, will you listen to music that's generated by AI? Will you eat the plate of food that's been created artificially? I mean, it's just it's just a question that 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 will keep um, keep us keep us interested, really. But AJ, I want to take a step further and ask you, you know, how do you see the AI theme evolving in terms of its broad industry impact? So how it's impacting industry more broadly? How do you see this playing out? Yeah, it's, it's going to be different for each industry, right? And, you know, when, when we think about AI evolution as it is now, it's really been one broad theme. It's been these frontier models. Think about your GPTs getting more and more advanced. And, you know, that could be great for a lot of services or industries or for any of the people online with students, you know, to help kind of cheat on your essay paper to use chat GPT, it's fine. But let's, you know, focus on your question more on, on the industry impact. You know, if you're, I used a lawyer example, so I'll change it to a different one. Think of healthcare. You know, right now, the industry AI capabilities for healthcare are pretty limited because you can't use just open source AI for this. but could we maybe use AI for more efficient ways of preparing for clinical trials? Could we maybe use AI for the eventual end game of, of drug discovery? You know, that's certainly in play, but it's gonna take years to evolve and increase the quality and the trust of this data. But also I think when you think of industry impact, one of the biggest ones is probably the industry many of you are in, and it's, it's financial services. You know, it's enterprise AI, how are we gonna get AI adopted in our financial services. Well, it's going to be in multiple different facets. You know, for one, some of the beneficiaries of this AI theme in financial services are just going to be the infrastructure plays that can actually scale up and get data organized for this AI you know, evolution. But secondly, think of all the back office functionality that can be done with AI. You know, could it be done to provide a better customer journey? Can it be provided for some of the, the research notes and making things more efficient. Or it could be used in even some of the more front office for idea generation on more of the complex 
know, client requests, we still think there's going to have to be a human in the middle. You know, going back to your first question almost, this isn't the, you know, no, the beneficiaries are going to be broad, but it's not going to completely just take all of our jobs. There will still be a human in the middle. But for a lot of these industries, financial services, it is going to come to enhance our productivity. And I want to give one, one more example in terms of, of industry impact. Um, it's certainly going to impact tech and some of the mega caps. You know, you think of these mega caps that have been dominant for so long. You know, you think of a, a Google or an Alphabet or Apple with the iPhone. They've had such a dominant position. But now with AI, you're starting to see more challengers. You know, there's companies now that are using AI that maybe can cut out the middleman on, you know, the traditional search model of everything going through ads and existing pages. Why can't it just be, you know, purely AI driven? And of course, you know, the era of AI on your phone is going to be critical. So all these, these phone manufacturers, it's going to be a race to see who can have the best AI integration on their hardware. So it will impact different industries, you know, very different. Uh, but certainly it's going to be a lot of disruption and innovation that we really haven't seen uh, to this scale you know, in the past five to 10 years. Yeah, I, li I like your point about you know, pairing human and machine, I think just adding to productivity and, and it's not replacing humans, it's actually making us more productive. That, that's, that's absolutely the glass half full perspective that I, that I subscribe to myself. Um, AJ, will any industries remain unscathed from your perspective, even if the most optimistic scenario of broad-based uh, AI adoption materializes? Yeah, you know, it, it's it's probably the number one question because we all think probably a little bit selfishly of our own job security, right? <laughs> if we could get through, you know, this unscathed. And the short answer is there there will be plenty. You know, some will have very minimal impact short term. Think about teachers, social work, counselors, you know, that's very human touch, right? Sure, you can have some online education and, and some digital apps that can provide the service, but, you know, a lot of those are, are very human-based. And, you know, also, you know, I mentioned healthcare and some of the efficiencies, but I try to intentionally avoid the term of, you know, drug discovery, GPT. I think that's a bit of the dream, and, and a lot of, you know, people are thinking about, you know, AI as, oh, it's going to be completely disrupt, you know, the whole drug discovery process, that's going to take years, if ever. We're certainly on that route and we want to make our best efforts, but even in areas like healthcare that are prone for AI disruption, it's going to take years. So you have some that are pretty immune. You have, you know, some where it's just going to make us, you know, more efficient, you know, financial services than healthcare where it's far away. But, you know, for many of you on the call that are thinking about, you know, what about my industry? You know, such a big innovation. Am I going to go through unscathed? You know, you can maybe almost think of this analogy. If you were, you know, in the accountancy industry in the '80s, and the evolution of spreadsheets came out, I bet they were having the same discussion. You know, you're there with your hand calculator and pen and paper, and it's like, oh man, I could just do this on the computer. <laughs> you know, what's going to happen to my job? There's a heck of a lot more accountants today than there were 30 years ago right? It just made you far more efficient. And it created opportunities to enhance your services. You know, you're no longer a, a human calculator or bookmaker, but you can offer, you know, tax advisory services, you can you know, open up more you know, opportunities within your business. You know, that's key. So when you think about industry impact, there's going to be very few that are unscathed. Keep in mind that it's a long timeline. So you know, don't hit the panic button. And maybe take a step back and think about that example. All these big, you know, innovative disruptions, they certainly have a big impact. Not every job is immune, but for a lot of industries and especially professional services industries, you know, focus on the efficiency add and that can add more value. So of course we'll we'll have to see where it goes, but you know, largely uh, that's our view that most, you know, professional services, it's going to be an enhancement, not to its detriment. Absolutely. I, I read yesterday that, you know, an interesting perspective is that um, new entrants into the job market, they, they, they're probably the most exposed to making them redundant. You know, if, if you think of someone fresh out of college or out of high school entering job market, you know, the, the type of work that they will do is more closely aligned to something that's menial that can be automated. 
but an interesting perspective is coming through from from managers that say well you need you need people to come through the ranks to actually do those meaning those menial jobs and, and do those repetitive jobs that can be automated to actually learn and because because that's on their journey to become productive to become useful to a company you need to learn to do those simple stuff and so you do see companies actually slower to uh, fully automate these menial jobs that they can give to young analysts because they need them to learn to become more useful um, and, and add value in areas where, where machines possibly can't. And so, again, that, that's, a, that's to your point, is even though the, the potential is there for disruption, you need that appetite to be there as well. I mean, most people that I ask, you know, that talk to about this topic, if you ask them, well, do you use ChatGTP on a daily basis? Most of them will say no. Uh, and so uh, it takes time for us to actually get used to the technology. And so luckily with time comes the ability to be nimble and comes the ability to actually adjust to a new normal. Um, and I, I, I take your point fully. I think, I think we'll, industries broadly will evolve gradually uh, and will do so in a less disruptive way than I think a lot of the protagonists to AI's rise have actually put forward. You know, they've, they've put forward this doomsday scenario of disrupting mass unemployment, but actually at the end of the day, it makes more logical sense to say, will more likely follow a route like, to your point, Excel with accountants or internet, um, where we gradually get used to actually building this into our workflow uh, and, and uh, adjusting to it accordingly. But thanks for your uh, perspectives, AJ. I think it's been, it's been wonderful to, to get your perspectives as well. Finally, I want to welcome back Kingsley Williams. He is Satrix's CIO and someone serving as a true example of natural intelligence superseding the artificial alternative <laughs> spoken of today. Kingsley, it's great to have you back. Um, you recently gave a really interesting talk at Investment Forum, where you highlighted our financial service, services industry's propensity to liberally use terminology like AI, machine learning, uh, and the like to provide a sense of complexity in its design without providing insight into how and why these technologies provide fund managers with an edge. Now, this is specific to our industry, but I think it applies more broadly. Can you elaborate on this? Why there's this need for making things seem more complex than they actually are? Yeah, sure, Niku. Um, and firstly, thank you to you and uh, all the other panelists for what I've really enjoyed. It's been a fascinating conversation hacking this, this topic. Um, yeah, so to your question, uh, one of the risks that we face as a new technology emerges is opportunistic use and uh, jumping on the bandwagon uh, of the latest buzzwords, um, since naturally this is what's going to grab people's attention. Um, it becomes quite tempting to start using this terminology, particularly in marketing material, because that's what's going to pique interest and hopefully lead to further sales and gathering of assets in the financial space. Now, in investments, the opportunity for this is even bigger as our domain is extremely complex with innumerable <coughs> variables driving the fortunes of financial markets. So this seems ripe for a groundbreaking technology like AI, which is adept at navigating the scale and the complexity of financial markets that we as humans are unable to fully grasp, especially since technology and processing power have already played a significant role in developing the sophistication and efficiency of financial markets. So what we then looked at was, and we actually found something quite interesting, was actually over the last few years, we've, we've you know, against a, a market backdrop of heightened dispersion among securities, and a broader spread of outperformance opportunities that have been available is actually a rather limited and in fact declining dispersion that we observed amongst funds themselves. Uh, and this is across a variety of different fund categories. So that then begs the question, why would that be? And I've got a couple of answers to that question, um, which I guess we'll have to do more research on. Um, the first one is, you know, is AI leading to groupthink, perhaps, um, you know, for, for the funds that are claiming to use AI in their investment process, um, and perhaps then generating very similar trades leading to further clustering and therefore less dispersion amongst funds. So that could be one reason. Another might be that AI is moving the market so quickly that more traditional funds are not even able to capture the alpha opportunities that have been available. Or finally, maybe it's that 
AI in, inv you know, in investments is purely marketing hype uh, by the managers claiming to use the technology, but which isn't actually being harnessed in any meaningful way. So as I mentioned, I'm sure there'll be a lot of research that gets done on this question um, in the near future, or maybe in fact, there is an AI model out there that already has the answer. So that that is the that is the key fear, right? Is that is that it's 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 being used as a um, as a as a catchphrase to to give a sense of complexity. But at the end of the day, you know, it's a, it, for a lot of managers, it's a black box. It's hard to reverse engineer that the, the, and, and, and provide insight into why certain investment decisions were made. Should they go down the path of fully embracing um, AI in its current form, at least now, Kingsley, Satrix is currently currently has a Nasdaq feeder ETF. And you have in the past suggested that bigger might indeed be better when it comes to being competitive in the current AI landscape. Now, can you share some of your views on how best to invest uh, in the tech theme if listeners want to not miss out on this, on this uh, potential um, investment uh, opportunity? Sure. Um, we've, you know, we've certainly, to your earlier point, uh, Niku, seen seen some very wide dispersion in returns between what we call blue chip tech versus uh, smaller innovative companies hiring some of the newer technologies that are available. Those are generally captured under a, a theme commonly referred to as the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, AI is part of that, but it encompasses various other emergent technologies as well. So for example, there's one such equity index capturing this fourth industrial revolution theme which has delivered a gross total return of minus 10.6% per annum in dollars for the last three years um, versus NASDAQ 100's plus 12.6% per annum over the same period. So if you look at that in cumulative terms, that's a difference of over 71%, uh, which just shows how dominant blue chip tech has been, and in particular, the Magnificent Seven. So, so yes, Satrix does offer a NASDAQ 100 ETF, which is listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and is available for investors to, to buy in RANDs. Uh, it provides diversified exposure to the 100 largest companies on the NASDAQ exchange. So while information technology does dominate that index uh, at almost 50% of its exposure, it also includes meaningful exposure to other sectors like communications, consumer discretionary stocks, healthcare stocks, and industrial companies. And by virtue of those companies in those other sectors being listed on the NASDAQ exchange, they have historically uh, had a very proud track record of being innovative companies themselves. So I don't have a crystal ball, and I, I wouldn't, but, I, but what I wouldn't do is bet against these companies in the other sectors within the NASDAQ 100 being very early adopters of what AI could potentially unlock. To, to the discussion that you were having earlier around disruption in other industries and sectors. So that said, it's very important uh, for investors to consider that their total portfolio exposure, <coughs> or, or sorry, let me say that again. It's very important that uh, investors do consider what their total portfolio exposure is and ensure that they remain well diversified across multiple dimensions and sources of risk. These could include things like geography, uh, what the investment style or factors are within their portfolio, and indeed across different asset classes as well. So beyond equities into bonds and, and uh, cash and various other asset classes. Um, and it's important that they do that to ensure that they ultimately reach their investment goals. So we don't need AI to tell us that we live in a very uncertain world. And, but what we do know is diversification is one of the, one of the few free lunches and uh, timeless truths in investing that we should always be mindful of when uh, looking to capture various themes in our portfolio. Make sure that you're very well diversified across the different drivers of return when trying to achieve, uh, achieve a particular investment goal or outcome. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, it, as, as you were speaking, I was thinking of that um, quote by Mark Twain, who said, when everyone is looking for gold, it's good to be in the picks and shovels business, right? And so um, these are certainly companies that will provide the picks and shovels for tomorrow's innovation across the sectors, I think. Um, 
I wonder if, if, if I can bring some of my uh, previous panelists back, perhaps, Michael, if we can get your perspective, um, seeing that, that you are um, Director of Economic and Statistical Research um, at the NASDAQ. Do you, do you agree with that statement that, that um, you know, when everyone's looking for gold, it's good to be in the picks and shovels? Do you, would you regard the, the NASDAQ as being sort of the pre preeminent destination for picks and shovels at the moment, um, considering the fact that, as all our discussants have, have suggested, you know, it, it's very hard to know how this technology will mature. It's very hard to know how companies will apply it, how they will integrate, where tomorrow's economic activity will reside. But at least, does it make sense from your perspective to suggest that this is an index, a preeminent index, if you like, for the companies that will be at the forefront for providing the picks and shovels for those that will discover gold in the future? Yeah, I think you. I think that's a, a fair way to put it because, of course, you have the kind of mega cap companies that are leading the way currently, uh, and then you also have the kind of breadth of companies that are in the whole Nasdaq 100, where there's more diversity. It's not just your your mega caps in there, so you do get that kind of you know hardware, software, um, and more kind of like the the layer cake components that were we were discussing earlier too. So that's um, all part of the, the puzzle. So I think that's a, a fair way to say you get that kind of diversification aspect there while, while generally being, you know, a lot of um, tech exposure too. Yeah. And AJ, if I can, if I can bring you back in for a second. So, you know, for, for years, Silicon Valley was seen as the chief disruptor to so many industries. Um, and and there's, there's those that should suggest we've gone full circle and that the tech, in tech industry itself has started sowing the seeds of its own demise by developing a technology that can potentially be as creative in many respects as its creator. So, you know, has, has Frankenstein been created um, and is it going to turn its, uh, on its master or do you not see it that way? <laughs> it's more of a, a sci-fi movie. Right, and maybe they've already made it about that, the uh, the doom of humanity from AI. <laughs> um, the, the short answer is is no. You know, there's constantly innovation in Silicon Valley. And granted, you know, every decade, there's, you know, transformative, innovative theme where it's almost instantaneous. The first thought is this is going to change everything. You know, you saw it in the 2000s with the internet and the 2010s with cloud and then 2020s you know, with AI. But it all goes back to a lot of the points that we've been talking about. And it's really about accelerating efficiency. Now, that's the key. Not every job will be secure. You know, if you're, you know, working at a, a, a call center or some of the, you know, standard business operator processes that it's very rules based, that could be a bit of trouble. But, you know, if you have employment in an area where it requires human touch or professional services where you can leverage this to be more efficient, you know, you should be okay. Um, so I, I think the key, the key thing you want to be is this theme's coming no matter whether you like it or not. You know, whether you believe in it or, or not, it's, it's coming. And those that are willing to adopt and be empowered by it, whether you're an employer or a business, you're probably going to be okay. You're going to be one of the winners. You know, if you, you fight it or, or don't believe it, it, it's going to be a lot tougher. But in terms of disrupting everyone, um, would make a great sci-fi movie. You know, I'll take the, uh, the patent rights for it, for the idea right now, but probably not going to come into fruition in, in this reality. Yeah, I, I think I think there's there's a lot of people that want to see the disruptors being disrupted themselves. But I, I, I take your point; it, it will likely be more, a bit more gradual and spread out. Um, Kingsley, I, I, I know I know you you're just recovering from from my incessant questions, but if I can bring you back once more, I think a lot of the the, the, the listeners dialing in, you know, might might be in the advisor space as well uh, in our financial services industry and might start to ask whether they will be, um, firstly, I'm, I'm going to ask a two-pronged question if you don't mind. So firstly, is there going to be space for advisors going forward or will they be replaced by robo-advisors? So how do you see the advice space um, maturing going forward? Because, um, you know, with, with ac access to information doesn't equate mastery of, 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 of information. You know, you, you can Google how to fix your plumbing, but at the end of the day, you're probably just going to phone a plumber, right? 
And so how do you see the advisory landscape going forward? And then secondly, and I think related to that, is how will the case for indexation, so rules-based investment approaches, how will that play out um, in an era of AI um, and, and where we see broader-based AI adoption? Sure. Okay, let me try and uh, answer your two-pronged question, Niku. Um, I think, firstly, on the advisor question, uh, we we have already seen disruption in the financial advisor uh, business model. We've, you know, historically, financial advisors would construct those portfolios themselves for clients, or they would take a portfolio from the, the product house that they were affiliated to. Um, but we've now got the rise of discretionary fund managers, what we call DFMs, uh, that are fulfilling that function in terms of portfolio construction. So, so what is the role of the financial advisor? Well, it's very much to provide advice uh, on other aspects outside of, uh, you know, specifically what you're invested in or what the client is invested in. Um, thinking about estate planning, uh, thinking about tax matters, um, being a life coach to ensure that uh, investors actually achieve their financial goals and stay the course and don't buckle at the worst possible time to miss out on those subsequent uh, recoveries. So th there's a huge role and very much a face-to-face -face role that financial advisors will continue to play. You ultimately want to sit across the table from someone that you have a trusting relationship with, look them in the eye, um, navigate all the uncertainties that we're grappling with as we talk about technology and its disruptive effect on the world, you want to be able to have those conversations with your financial advisor and, uh, you know, be able to say, okay, let's, let's do this. This seems to be a prudent way to go in terms of what I'm trying to achieve with, uh, with my savings. Um, to your second question on what the role of indexation would be, um, I sort of tried to touch on it a little bit in one of your earlier questions uh, that I was responding to. And you know, I think the, the markets are such a dynamic uh, place with so many actors and agents uh, fulfilling a price discovery role through various different uh, means of valuing stocks and, and, and various different investment horizons that, you know, to the extent that AI can uh, exert a force on making investment decisions, that's only going to further drive efficiency or speed of price discovery. And I guess the question is maybe to flip it on its head. What is the role for active management or traditional? Additional active that moves so quickly and is so globally interconnected. How on earth do you extract an edge when everyone is, you know, armed with that information and can act on it so quickly? And so I think indexation, because it ultimately captures uh, the market very efficiently and delivers the returns of what the market is doing very efficiently to clients, um, is a great way of of you know continuing to very cost effectively. Uh, save for the long term and invest for the long term uh, because you know prices are going to be you know more difficult to 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 find an anomaly because uh, you've got so many different algorithms actors and agents fulfilling that price discovery role so i hope that does some justice to your question absolutely so in other words what you're saying is the price that a company trades at is the combination of all the complexity in the market baked into that price and so as markets become more efficient with the advent of ai and with us you know, being more uh, efficient at pricing um, uh, companies in the market, then that just simply means that finding price inefficiencies become harder and harder to do. And so that will potentially root out those active managers that are not capable of finding those opportunities. The fact that there will be opportunities, absolutely, we can't deny that. Um, but the case for indexation, certainly for rules-based investment approaches that accept prices as being efficient and try to add value on the margin, whether that be through lower cost in a vanilla vehicle or capturing longer term trends or themes, um, I think that that case will, will just become stronger uh, in the future. And it's a, it's a great point that you make on advisors, the fact that, you know, if you think of the advisory space, just providing clients with more information and a platform that now, you know, collates information efficiently, but lacks nuance, lacks uh, your own personal circumstance and that context that is simply lacking in these algorithms. I think the case for, for advisors remains strong and will continue to remain strong in the future. 
Uh, with that, our time has unfortunately uh, run out. I want to thank our wonderful speakers. Um, Michael, firstly, thank you to you. Laura, AJ, and then uh, Kingsley as well. Thank you for, for all your insights. And to all our listeners, thank you for joining us. Um, and we hope to see you next time. Uh, with that, uh, all the best. Goodbye.